right, thank you. Uh, very pleased to be here. I uh, have the fortune and uh, pleasure to be working with Jeremy for quite a number of years. So that naturally allowed me to uh, accumulate a number of anecdotes, which are typically shared in this kind of um, venue. But after thinking about it, uh, I'm not sure they're quite fitting. So I'm, I'm just going to say an observation. Um, I mean, so uh, it appeared to me that uh, Jeremy, the problems that Jeremy are interested in ranges from very difficult to seemingly impossible, um, as far as I can tell. All right, with that said, let's head into a talk. All right, so this is about hydrodynamic activations for take step. Uh, so. Okay. To be working. Uh, okay. I can yeah. So, uh, first of all, the model takes that to stand for two to the symmetric simple solution process. So, you have particles occupying the integer lattice, and then each particle decide uh, has a Poisson clock of break one. When the clock rings, the particle decides to jump one step to its right. If that side is not occupied, if that side is being occupied, the particle has to give up the jump and then wait for the next time. And now there's a nice way to encode uh, the configuration of particles through what's called height function. So the height function has slope one whenever there's a particle and has slope negative one whenever there's no particle. So you see on the screen, um, I guess we just have to see it. Um, so there's slope one when there's a particle and the next one, there's no particle. And the evolution of the particle nicely translates into the evolution of the height as you can see on screen, where the particle jump one step to the right, it amounts to flipping a local maximum into a local minimum. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about um, the large scale behavior of the team step and we'll focus on the uh, height function, even though you can translate everything to the particle configuration. Um, so we'll look at the hyperbolic scale in which is you run the dynamics for a long amount of time, denoted by big N. Big N is going to infinity, and simultaneously you scale uh, the lattice by that same amount. And then because the height function increases or decreases by one, it's natural to scale down the height by one over here. Okay, so that's the scale height function. All right, um, the first question you can ask is there a, what, what does it look like if you do this kind of scale? So um, it is a now possible result um, about the hydrodynamic limit. So even though the evolution of PSAP is random, if you look at it under this kind of uh, hyperbolic large scale scaling, it's gonna converge, the, the evolution is gonna converge to something deterministic described by PD. This goes under the name of hydrodynamic limit. So the way it goes is you assume that initially the scale height function h sub n at zero converges to a you know deterministic function f of n. Then if that's true, uh, it's proven by you know, a number of people using different methods that uh, the corresponding height function will converge to the solution of the hamilton jacobi equation of the Burgers equation. So for those of you who are more familiar with the density of the particle. Configuration, look at the section line. It's the derivative of height function which corresponds to a density that converges to invisible Burgers equation. Alternatively, integrate that equation together one above. I have mentioned the equation of Burgers. Okay. Now, um, for uh, this is the invisible Burgers equation, the hydrodynamic limit is a fully nonlinear hyperbolic PDE. And you know that so solution, weak solutions to these kind of PDE are typically not unique. And then um, in order to specify the uniqueness of the solution, you have to impose an additional assumption that can be done by imposing uh, what's called the entropy condition. And the one that uh, he said is conversion to is the unique entropy solution, the one was satisfying the entropy condition, right? Does that make sense so far? All right, so following hydrogen element, which you can think of as the log lock number at the level of the function, uh, the next question that you can ask is about the, the large evolutions, right? So hydrogen element says that the 
type function h sub n converges to something deterministic, which is the entropy solution of Hamilton Jacobi burgers. Large division says, okay, what is the unlikely event that T sub doesn't do that? So you take something, you take G, which is again just the deterministic function of space time, that is different from the typical one, that is different from the solution of Hamilton Jacobi burgers. Uh, what is the probability, what is the unlikely probability that theta will approximate that function g? And the way you set it up is that typically the thing is, has exponentially small probability. And for a reason I explained to you in a few slides, the, the order, the speed, should be e to the minus n. And on top of that, there's a rate function depending on what kind of configuration g that you're looking at. Okay, so that's the setup for long deviations. Here I put the actual definition of large division principles, uh, here they are. I'm not gonna go for that, so I'm just gonna operate on the um, informal level, which I read above here, okay? So before we head into you know, what is the, the actual large division, I want to you know, using a few slides to give you a rough sense of what do you expect, you know, what's, what's the mechanism of the division that we're looking at, and you know, what should you expect? Now, for this purpose, let's look at a specific initial data, so-called step initial data, where you have uh, all the sides to the right of the origin being occupied, and all the sides to the left of oops, sorry, to the left of origin occupied to the right of origin entity. And remember, I'm using plus one convention. So, oh, with particles it's density plus one, with no empty sides density negative one. So naturally, the density is a step. Now, if just let the thing evolve, the hydrodynamic limit, the typical behavior, it's gonna look like the, the one on the left, but below. It's gonna widen, widen up into a linear function, keep widening, widening, and then the initial step is gonna be kept at negative infinity and positive infinity. So it's a piecewise linear function. Now you can plot this over space time, and one convenient way to do that is you plot the lines along which you reach the constant. Okay. So those lines that you're seeing on the right, they, they are characteristic, and there are just lines where u is a constant. So you see at the first half, there are things going out. Those are the sort of the, the thing that propagate outward by the positive one density on the left and negative one density on the right. And then in the middle, you see a fan that's sort of parameterizing how the thing widens open up uh, in the middle. So that's the refraction solution. This is the hydrodynamic limit. So the thing that you're seeing on the on this on the screen is a particular entropy solution. It's the entropy solution of Burgers started from the step entropy. Okay, that makes sense. Now the question we're asking is how can T step deviate from this typical situation? Now, what's a way it could potentially do with small probability that will not follow this specific um, solution? And one way to do it is to slow down a few sides of origin. So you can think of TSA as you know, traffic going from left to right. Those particles are trying to hop, right? From left to right. And one way to observe it is to say, um, I'm gonna slow down the way it goes uh, across near the origin. Okay. So something like this. Actually, I slow down a few sides of origin. And what's gonna happen is that it's gonna cause an artificial traffic. So if you slow down the side or at the origin, it's gonna slow down the flow from left to right of the of the particle flow. And if you think about a moment, uh, what th that should do is it's gonna cause a jump in the density as we see um, on the left lower here. Okay, so across the origin, the density has a jump. That jump is artificial, it's being created by you manually slow down the jump uh, near the origin. And if you plot out the characteristic on the right, those again, those lines are characteristics, those lines are, are lines along which uh, U is a constant. You see, uh, at the origin, there are characteristics sort of shooting out of origin. So time goes down. So these, these are characteristics going out of origin. Now, in the language of PD, hyperbolic PD, the place where characteristics merge or you know, being created are shock waves. But this kind of shock wave that you're seeing, or alternatively, places where you have a jump is, you know, it has been thought of as shock, shock wave. And you see a shock wave at the origin. But this kind of shock wave is artificial in the sense that you see shock being a sort of characteristic being coming out of the 
coming out of their shell. Where a typical situation you see uh, characteristic emerging into their shell. And that's called non entropy shock. So, this is the key feature of the kind of division that we're looking at. You try to slow down a few signs that will create shocks, but those shocks are artificial. And as I'll explain later, they are non entropy. They are not the thing that you typically see in, uh, you will not see in normal behavior. Okay. So, uh, for this particular configuration, has been shown by Landin and Tablanian that uh, the, the, uh, the figure on, on the right, namely, if they, they should solve. There should be that particular solution of uh, burgers with um, some presumably undetermined um, jump size. Okay. Does that make sense so far? All right. So, this is a good time to pause and sort of try to get back to things happening on the previous slide. So, if this is the kind of deviation that governs the LDP large deviation principle that we're interested in, what should be the scale the order of the seed? Well, in order for this slowdown to happen, something unlikely has something of you know unlikely has to happen at every unit time around the origin. For example, one way to do this is slow down one side of the origin. So maybe every time the plus on plus rings, you flip a coin, which probably one half you suppress the jump. So that's you know big old one probability at every unit time. At the, that single side or a few sites, and you run this for 20 n. So the speed of deviation should be to the minus n, as I said previously. Now, the space of deviation, I hope I convinced you, I'm not sure, um, that they should be the set of weak solution. So the figure on the right here, it is still, you can check, it is still a weak solution uh, for the, the same Burgers equation. The only thing that is different, though, is that. It is no longer an entropy solution because of the it's artificial shock being generated um, at the origin. Okay. So what should happen is that um, you look for all possible deviations, uh, sorry, all possible weak solution that's not entropy one at Burger's equation, and that should um, produce the space of deviation of phase seven. All right, so um no talk is complete on this topic without mentioning uh, the pioneering work of Jensen and Bergman. Um, so this is um, this is the work uh, this is a theorem coming from the work of Jensen and Bergman. Up to super exponential all small probability, which is the speed that we're looking at, the improvement density of tens take that concentrate around weak solution of the invasive Burgers equation. So that's the second rule coming from the previous slide. That is the space of deviation. That's the space that you should be looking at. And uh, now that's just, you know, we have the speed, we have the space. Now the question next question is what is the rate function, right? So going back, going back to large division, the first display on the top, uh, we have that thing, and then there's a rate function that depends on what kind of deviation you're looking at. The question is what should that uh, rate function be? Now, as it turns out, it's being described by some, some Kuchkov and some entropy production in the Burgers equation. Now, in order to tell you what that is, I need to run through um, this slide to tell you a little bit about Kuchkov entropy production. So, take any strictly convex function from minus one, one, define minus one, one. You should think of this set minus one, one, the set of your density, right? My, my premise relation is negative one for empty side, positive one for, for particles, so the density could range, could range from negative one to one. So the entropy is a function of that space. Any strictly complex function, do it as some sort of entropy. Once you're given entropy, you can define what's called entropy flux on the second line. Okay, J is defined that way. So why do why, I why, why define that, and why, why does that make sense? Well, the thing is that if you have a smooth solution of the invisible Burgers equation, and you can just check by calculus, by can rule to be precise. That if you define J in this way, then it has the display equation here. So they find the derivative of the entropy evaluated on solution of burgers, smooth solution of burgers, is the x derivative of the entropy flux. Well, with that thing, it's, you know, it's, it justifies the name entropy flux because um, the content of the uh, the entropy is given by the sort of space flux of the entropy flux of J. Okay. 
Well, but here's the piece. The, uh, the equation I wrote here is proven by Chen rule. It assumes that solution is C1. What happens if the solution is not? And that typically happens for Berger's equation. Remember, Berger's equation typically generates what shocks. So what happens when the solution is not smooth? My opinion is actually but actually it's not true. There's one um, factor of the calculation that you can do. Is remember when I say shocks are where uh, you have jumps in you. So you can just check for the simplest case where U is constant with uh, you know, constant jump. Okay, uh, this is a nice exercise to do. There are two cases where you can have in, in this in this piecewise piecewise constant configuration. You can have that the right end is higher or the right end is lower. Now, if you think about traffic jams, the one on the left is sort of the natural traffic jam, right? If you have higher than particle go from left to right, if you have a higher density on the right, that will automatically create a traffic jam. So that's sort of the natural shock. But there are different kinds of shock which you can create manually. You can slow down a few sides. At a shot, as, as I showed you a few slides earlier, that could create an artificial shot, which is shown on the right. Now, if you go ahead and calculate uh, what is supposed to zero when a solution is smooth, you'll see that in the natural case, the quantity comes out to be negative, and in the artificial case, it comes out to be positive. And that's been coined in them entropy shot and non entropy shot. Okay, so entropy shot. It's the natural one, which uh, this flux quantity comes out to be negative, and not entropy one, which is the one that is relevant to our division, comes out to be positive. All right. So now is the time you can produce entropy solution. So um, if you have a weak solution of the inverted Butter's equation, you can view your solution as a measure on PNX. If that quantity there is always non-positive, um, it suggests that solution is entropy. And it's actually a theory. For any strictly convex I view as the entropy, uh, there is one and only one solution with this property that this entropy production comes out to be non-positive ever. Okay. Now, with that in mind, um, the so that was a general description. Now, but there was a free function. There was this I function, which can be taken to be any strictly convex function. Now, for the case of T7, you know, what, what is, there's a very natural choice. So it is a fact that T7 has product removing measures as it is in very institution. Namely, if you flip a coin with probability rho, which is fixed, of coming up paths and do it independently side to side, that measure is invariant onto the evolution case up. In fact, for any content rate solution process. Okay. This is the invariant uh, distribution equation, invariant distribution for case up, where rho is the parameter of parameterized density. Now, with that being the case, the nat a natural choice of the rate function is the rate function of the of sums of Bernoulli random error. So we are going to take i to the uh, i bird, which stands for the rate functions of sums of i random variable. And on top of that, you could have the corresponding entry flux, which is the J bird. And the rate function that to describe the large deviation principle for T set should be the positive part, which I recall is the non entropy part. This is non entropy one when it's positive, the non entropy part of the entropy production integrated over space time of your candidate deviation. And this is something that is uh, proposed by Jens and Mary. All right, so to recap, we have a speed of deviation, which happens with n, and then the space are just weak solution of burgers, and the, the, the rate function should be this positive non entry part of entropy production um, evaluated on the deviation. Okay. That makes sense. Yes, can we again just take it one? So if you have a, an entropy solution, this is zero. Yes. Anything else? Uh, is the comparison always on the uh, finite intervals? What comparison? Uh, so the large deviation principle. 
Uh, well, we did it on uh, the full one today. If you, the, the strength of, I mean, we, we did it on the full one. Is that your question? It was stated on zero T. Oh, you mean interval time? Yeah. That's... Uh, I, I guess you could, you can try to push this to infinite time, but the things that you can't, the, the, the strengths of the non interval shock has to decrease, right? Otherwise, the rate of the is. If you look at those evasions such that the, um, you have like only a finite amount of non interval So, for example, you have a non interval shock that keeps going, the strength has to decrease. You can do that. That's not what we have another particle system that has product invariant measure because the sort of picture you expect in general doubles. So, uh, the general picture from Yenis and Vernon is that if you have a PE, in, in this case, it's in this verge, it has invariant distribution, which is, you can just run the same rest. So, if you're given the equation or given the fixed point, uh, it's further it's Berger's equation, but without this truncation of minus 0.1, and this i just um, be parabolic. The rate on the curve for ground mesh. All right, so that's you know that's the picture. What is known? Um, so the prior work of Jensen Barron proved that the T step satisfied the upper sort of large division upper bound with that rate on it. I show you on the previous slides. So uh, large division upper bound. This is this. Too long, don't read things like I showed you earlier. So, the precise definition of large division principle is written here. It's you can decompose it into upper bound lower bound. So, this display, the last inequality in that display is large division upper bound, and the, the first one is lower bound. And you've got maximum upper and lower bound in that first large division principle. Uh, so yes, I've already proved that case that does satisfy the upper bound with that rate function. Now, natural question is to, to complete the problem, you just need to, you know, prove lower bound, match lower bound. What's done in yes and Baradine and Velasquez, not for all weak solution though, around spatial weak solution. Now, I'm not going to specify the condition, but you know, where you can sort of have nice characteristics, nice description of the shapes. So in order to complete this project, the next thing to do is to try to do the large division lower bound around any weak solution of burgers. But unfortunately, that is very presumably a bizarre space. We, we don't have a full understanding of all the weak solution of burgers equation. And uh, there are some really there are some substantial amount of work going into analyzing the properties of weak solutions of burgers. Um, and also, another thing that you can do is try different models. Instead of TSA, you can look at random PDE. You can look at a different version of a PDE version of the problem, so L2 version. You can also look at higher dimensions. The result along this line of similar flavor you have a full upper bound and you have lower bound once you assume the weak solution that we're looking for. Okay. So, at a general level, this remains an open problem. Now, for TSA, it has some very nice algebraic structure. So the way it's matches the exclusion process, it's exactly solvable. And there's a nice incremental formula by uh, Constantine, Jeremy, and Daniel. So what Jeremy proposed to me is, why don't we just calculate it? And it works. <laughs> so for TSAT, we can prove that it does satisfy the full large division principle. But I have to manage, I have to emphasize that. So, we prove it was a presumably, presumably different rate function. So prove that satisfy the full activation principle where the rate function is not evaluated at any weak solution. So rather evaluate as a set of weak solution that I would call elementary. I'll, I'll get to that in a few slides. And then for general weak solution, you just, you just define the rate function by approximation through elementary solutions. So if you think about it, the real improvement compared to what's done before in our work is that we actually improve the upper bound, not the lower bound. We say in order to get the upper bound, you don't have to consider all the weak solutions. You just need to consider a nice one. 
Now, for lower bound, it's known that the nice ones, you know, behave nicely. So the way we match upper and lower, lower is not the typical lower bound; it's actually the upper bound. And it remains open the question of whether you know, this this general thing can be approximated by night weak solution. My my guess is yes, but we don't have the proof. And the methods that we started from uh, this determinant formula I mentioned earlier, and from that you can try to extract the finite dimensional activation principle. Now, once you have finite dimensional activation principle, it, it's more or less a done deal. You can approximate the full activation from finite dimensional activation. So I'm going to try to explain you know, how do we extract finite dimensional activation. And for that matter, I'm going to start from a specific initial data. So the, the wedge initial data, which is also the, the step initial data. So in terms of particle system, this is step initial data. But if you draw the height function, it's slope one on the left, slope next one on the right. So it's exactly the wedge. Okay. I'm going to start my case up on this specific initial data. I'm not going to look at the entire activation, I'm just going to look at Fixed time large deviation at a later time, little t. Okay? So, and I'm actually not going to do that. I'm only going to look at finite dimensional large deviation at time t. So I have three points x1, a1, through x3, a3. That's what is the probability, the rate that highest function goes to the three point at time t. So at time t, the height dynamic limit, if you solve this, this refraction solution, you look at it at a level of high function, uh, the solution is given by this p function p. It's basically a parabola and then saturated at this plus minus one. And now I pick three points above that, that shape p, and that's what is probably going through that three points. Well, one word, these three points must be above this blue curve for two reasons. One is if you look at particle system, if you pick any point below that curve, the speed is up. The speed is going to be n squared. So that's not the kind of deviation that we're looking at. But another reason is that uh, you can show at PD level, no weak solution at time t will, will go through, will go under P. Okay? So any weak solution has to stay above weight for the deviation. So that's the thing that you should be looking at. So what is the probability of this? Now, the rate function, the fixed time finite dimensional uh, rate function, is given as follows. Imagine that you uh, you take a rubber band and wrap it around this function p. It has some elasticity. It would like to stay on p, but instead of that, you pin this rubber band at these three points, make it go through that. The rate function is sort of the elastic energy through um, through these points. So what happens is that you look at the rate function of Bernoulli random model, typical of as this elastic energy, and you compare your pin curve, the elastic energy of your pin curve to that of the blue curve. That is the rate function. And it's not hard to convince yourself that it should be like kind of piecewise linear until it touches the, the, the function P. That's sort of the shape. Okay. And this picture, this, this rate function, this picture can be seen for, for those of you who are familiar with Brown and these property non intersecting line ensemble. This can be seen very transparently that way. In fact, uh, this has been pushed, this, this kind of argument has been pushed to a proof of the a large deviation principle at time t for the case of the equation by Milan Hector and uh, Andrew and Louis, um, though we just got it out of the term. Yeah. So this is fixed time large so this is you know the fixed sign uh, finite dimensional large division principle, but you have this. Okay, let me let me say a few words about how do we get it. So get it from from determinants, um, which I'm not going to write down. Um, okay, and well, there's explicit problem determinants which you can express the probability, the finite dimensional probability at time t. Now, for experts um, on, on this subject, if you look at this one point optical activation and try to do it with, with determinants, it, it's not a very difficult thing. What happens is that uh, when you look at this one point optical deviation, if you expand the problem determinant at the infinite series, which are relatively under uh, parentheses depth, um, the terms are nicely ordered. So trace of the, the first term is much smaller than one, the second term is much smaller than the first one, and it's well down to a pretty straightforward analysis of the trace. What was a little bit surprising is that even in the upper tail region, if you look at multiple points, the series is already not as nice. It is have some very delicate cancellation. If you go calculate term by term, sometimes it blows up as, a, as opposed to going back to zero. 
And what happens is that there's some delicate insulation, which is coming again, the idea of truth. And the proof really is somewhere for its nature. It, it proves to be by handful of those, those things. So um, you got this finite dimensional distribution, but how is it related to, to crucial entropy production? Think about it, we start from a web initial data and a later time you have some deviation in terms of the random block. But it's supposed to describe some crucial entropy production of some weak solution that can then turn zero to the IP. So how, 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 how does that work? So this is where elementary solution comes. So you need to devise a very specific weak solution that connects this wedge initial data to the terminal that you're seeing, such that some crucial entropy production along this weak solution gives you this other ray function I showed you earlier. So how do you come up with this weak solution? So this is something that was already observed in work of Jensen Baradine and, and also a physics literature. It seems that the way you come up with this elementary solution is to run Burgers backward in time. So you look at the backward Burgers equation, the display there, and you run the entropy solution of the backward equation starting from that, that's rubber main configuration. Now, might be thinking I'm out of mind. Am I not saying that we should consider non entropy solution? But there's an interesting fact. The entropy solution of a backward equation is a weak solution of the forward equation, but generally non entropy. So you run the same backward entropy, but when you look at forward, it's actually non entropy, and it's supposed to be the right guy to be looking at. So let me show you some pictures. So on the left is one configuration. Now I draw time backwards, so going down is forward. But now what we do is we go, we, we run it back, we run it back when in time, okay? So as entropy solution. So you see, if you go back, if you go up, all the characteristics merge into a shot. So in backward frame, it is entropy. But now if you look at top down, the characteristic kind of merge, so it's diverge out of the characteristic. So it was entropy back when in time, but forward in time is not entropy. And the entropy production along those red shocks matches the random log rate function actually work always. Okay. That's so yeah. yeah. What if you have a check? Yeah. 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 Right, right, right. That's right. So when I said this always works, it's only this specific initial data. So you, you won't see that in this specific initial data. And we, I, I don't think I have time to get to it. But when you generalize to, to general initial data, you get it. You get those things, but just in a very simple way. So, so yeah. But that's true. That's true. All right. And so when you have, so this is one thing I, there's a fun fact. If you have those red dots being concave everywhere, then you can show that the trajectory of the shot is actually P twice the okay. But you can also have a configuration where you have you know, concave and convex on the right channel. Uh, what's going to happen is that only the concave one will generate a shot. And the trajectory is actually not always true. It's linear and it's curved in the region. That's saying that the one that is right. It contributes in a in a in a implicit way. So the convex one fans out if you look back one time, and that would have the effect of mod modifying the strengths. Of the shock of the of the of the red, so it, it doesn't directly contribute, but it does affect the strengths of that. And so still, it contributes in plus. Yeah. Do you have a mapping from the the height function thing to that picture, the shock picture? Well, it's the backward solution. I mean, can try to write it down. Yeah. You know that. It, it's supposedly sure implicit, explicit, but not so explicit actually. <laughs> All right, uh, this, I just want to mention that this, this matching proposition doesn't use the term. It supposedly should work generally, use own calculus. Um, and well, so that's a matching, and you could conjecture that, okay, so what have we done? We found the rate function at terminal time, we match it to a specific 
But if you look at from the general picture of Yen's environment, what you should do is instead of doing this, you should look at all weak solutions that satisfy the initial condition and the terminal condition and minimize over the crucial entropy production. Of course, we were not able to do that. But if you believe this, these two pictures you know, consistent, then the minimizer should be this elementary solution. So there's a conjecture. I just mentioned that for the case of um, KPD equation under a similar or weaker deviation, um, we prove, and also this concave configured computer conditioning, we prove that the high function does converge to that uh, in turn, does converge to that uh, metric solution. This is what's here. All right. Um, so that was the single wedge initial data. And I can try to generalize this to multi wedge. Um, so you have instead of a single wedge, you have a number of wedges as your initial data. Now, because pace up increased or increased by one, the most general initial data is a one Lipschitz function. And you could approximate any one Lipschitz function by wedges of this type. Right? So if you can solve this problem from finding the main wedges, you can approximate the whole thing. And we similarly look at a finite number of points at terminal time. And the rest of it run through, I don't think I have time to go through it, but basically um, you just try to connect. You just try to connect the points to its wedge. And when it's not clear which one to connect to, but for example, the second one from the left, it could connect to the one on the left or the one in the middle. You just try all of them and find the best, the one that minimizes. And then you run the elementary weak solution separately and take the maximum. When you take the maximum, you get you get the weak shock, uh, the, 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 sorry, the shock that Martin mentioned. But I guess you don't have time to get to it. And once you have that, um, you can approximate, okay, so you can approximate generic initial data by this uh, finitely many wedges initial data. You can approximate any terminal data by finally point that you're your yard. You're probing, so you will be able to get fixed high large deviation from generic initial data to generic terminal data. And once that is done, because theta is marked up, you can just propagate through the time to mark up properly. Make this the time go smaller and smaller and just stack it in on top of each other. So that's basically your proof. Okay, so um, before I end, um, I just want to say that at the beginning of this, this project, I thought Jeremy was really out of your mind. How can you calculate the heck out of this? Uh, our collaboration proven up, who proven pro pro me wrong over and over again, not just this time. So a lot of good things have happened. I'm sure more is to come. Thank I'm sure we'll hear many instances where Jeremy was out of his mind. Any <laughs> <laughs> um, <I have> questions? <laughs> So if not, uh, let's thank you, Jane, again. <laughs>